Okay, let's get started. Okay, so I am the host of Real Science Radio. It's been about a year and three months since Bob Inyar passed away. He was the uh, originator of Real Science Radio, as many of you probably know. I became his co-host now 16 years ago. We've gone through a full year. Uh, you know, Bob's up in heaven, probably talking to Sir Isaac Newton still. Um, so this is uh, Doug McBurney. He's been working with Bob Inyar for years, longer than I have been. And he has a, a radio show called The Weekly Worldview. He has stepped to the plate and he's now my co-host. I couldn't be happier. Um, I think Doug does a great job and he's in line with, uh, obviously with the biblical worldview. So this is our website. You can get there at rsr.org. We have a really good search, multiple, multiple creation search, site search. So if you want to look for some topic on creation, it will search all the major creation groups, including RSR. The thing I really like about what Bob Vineyard did for RSR, if you need to find the topic, just go to rsr.org and slash dino. I guarantee you it will pull a really good page on dinosaurs. rsr.org slash whales. Really good show on whales. I've been told by a lot of people that RSR is their favorite resource to go find information. Really good stuff to use with atheists. If you need to make a presentation to a church, I and I think Bob did a fantastic job of setting that up, and we hope to continue that as we move forward. Okay, so we're at, we uh, broadcast on AM six seventy every Friday at three p.m. But most people probably now listen to us on a podcast. And you can get, you can access our podcast with Spotify. I think there's one from Apple, whatever it's called. You Apple people will know. But you can get to our podcast in different ways. Here's a few that I listed on the website. My son Ryan does a few shows with me. He does Creation Magazine with me about, I don't know, probably three times a year, three or four times a year. He said, I'm the first radio talk show host who doesn't know what a podcast is. <laughs> The first podcast, because I really didn't at the time, I made some weird comment about podcasts. Like, what device do I need to buy to make it passed onto a pod or some crazy thing? Like, and this was, so on, the, on air, he's like, you know, Fred, my dad doesn't know, he's the first pod, podcast host who doesn't know what a podcast is. <laughs> I do now. So here is the Spotify's Real Science Radio podcast. When we were at uh, Creation Ministries International Conference this last June, we met a guy in a taxi cab and he took a great interest in not a taxi, it was an Uber. He took a great interest in our show and we were able to point him to uh, this podcast. He was fascinated when we were talking to him about the flood and different things like that. He had never heard that stuff before. So really cool stuff. Okay. So I'm going to just start going through what were my favorite shows. There's a few I'm leaving. There's going to be quite a few I leave off that were really good shows. Because I want to try to fit this into a, about an hour, out one hour time frame, and so I'm going to start kind of go through the year. And we started off 2022 with a topic called terminal lucidity. I'm not sure how many people have heard of this. This is basically where there's this condition where people are about to die, and maybe they were they had Alzheimer's, they were in a coma, whatever the case may be, and they have this lucid moment suddenly. And then, you know, within hours or days, they pass away. So this survey in Britain, 70% Brit, of caretakers in a British nursing home said they personally observed people with dementia becoming lucid shortly before their death. So this isn't uncommon. And the scientific community, the secular scientific community, does not dismiss this. They've got articles about it. Matter of fact, there are several published articles on this phenomenon. This is probably the most interesting one of all. This was uh, Anna Kath Katharina Emmer, and I'm going to read you, you, you her account because I think you'll find it really fascinating. Emmer was among the patients with the most severe mental disabilities who have ever lived in our institution. From birth on, she was seriously retarded. She had never learned to speak a single word. She gorged her food, fouled herself day and night. We have never seen that she'd ever taken notice of her environment, even for a second. And this is when this, there was a, a man, a, a Lutheran pastor, and he entered the room with the doctor near her death. When we entered the room together, we did not believe our eyes and ears. Emmer, who had never spoken a single word, sang dying songs to herself. Specifically, she sang over and over again, 
Where does the soul find its home? Oops, sorry. I'm gonna move the mouse out of the way because people will see that on Zoom. Where does the soul find its home? It's peace, 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 heavenly peace. For half an hour, she sang. Her face, up to then stultified, was transfigured and spiritualized. Then she quietly passed away. Like myself and the nurse who had cared for her, Dr. Whitman had tears in his eyes. So these two guys, one was a pastor, one was a doctor, they independently talked about this in, in talks and um, presentations they did the rest of their lives. They were just totally floored by this occurrence. And what's really interesting about terminal lucidity, a lot of us probably in this room, some of you might have experienced it. When I happened to mention the show to her, my mom, she said that my grandfather, not her dad, but my dad's dad, had gone through a period of lucidity right before he passed away. And this is what's really interesting for me, is tonight I met a friend for dinner. And I, you know, we hadn't seen each other maybe six months. We used to work together. We try to get together every now and then. And I told Ralph about this, uh, about this thing, about what we we're going to talk about tonight. And so they got to try to come and, you know, he wasn't able to, but I mentioned this terminal lucidity and he got real curious and I explained it to him. He goes, that happened with my dad. He said, my dad called me. He was like 80 years old. He hadn't been super coherent for a long time, for probably at least 10 years. And he said, he called me on the phone at three in the morning. He said, I felt like I was talking to a 30 year old man. He was completely coherent, like he hadn't been in a decade. And then he passed away not that long afterwards. So just tonight, really interesting. So the reason I show this image, it's, you know, our brain has the two lobes, the left and the right, and the left does certain things and the right does certain things. Well, people with a severe form of epilepsy, they'll have a procedure that cuts those two lobes in half and disconnects them. And it was really interesting when they did that, you had some scientists thinking that they're going to now have a split personality, but it wasn't the case at all. They functioned completely normal. They just had a few things like if you cover one of their eyes and you show them a letter and you have them say, maybe push a button. If it's not tied to the right side of the body, they may not be able to push a button or say anything, but they, they recognize the character. And what was super interesting is if you show them concepts like a vowel as opposed to a letter, they would recognize it even though there's no way that that signal could have, got, could have gone to the other side of the brain. I'm not gonna get into the details of that, but it really shows a consciousness that a lot of doctors have written about and some of them it converted them to, uh, you know, it made them believe in a higher power. So here's the ongoing research that I mentioned. These are different journals that have published these stories. I'm not going to get into details of those, but again, this is ongoing research. We've got some related shows of this topic. We have a show called, the, we have a list of brain dead patients who recovered. This is a remarkable list that uh, it is just amazing. Some of the, the stories that have been out there. Some people were actually on the operating room, getting ready to have their organs removed. They can't communicate to the world, hey, I'm actually conscious. I know what you're doing to me. And then they wake up. We've had cases of that. Think of how many times somebody's been on the operating table, have their organs removed, and they're not able to make, they're, they're, they don't recover in time to say, hey, stop. So go to rstar.org slash brain dash dead, and you can read about all the different stories that we have on when brain dead isn't really dead. We've got a good show on savants. This wasn't a show from last year, but it was from the year before. It's one of my favorite shows. And there's some people that have this ability to tap into their brain and be able to do amazing things. Like this one guy who could, it's like he can do quickly do trigonometric, trigonometric calculations in his head and he uses a slingshot and he's a bull, he's a dead eye with it. Um, there's many examples in history. We, we think of Michael Curry or Stephen Curry, excuse me, that he's a savant, that he's able to tap into things that were in the, that God originally programmed in our brain. Bob Vineyard came up with what I thought is a really good definition for savant that should be in the encyclopedia or the dictionary. It's a person who can access some of the originally created extraordinary capabilities of the mind and the brain, which because of sin are now mostly latent. 
For a person with psych, a, psych, a physiological break in the barrier that formed after man's fall, that break opening partial access through the barricade designed to block access to our greatest intellectual potential. So again, part of the fall. I think it's a really good definition. You think of other savants, and we could go on and on. I think that was a super cool show. I think that was my favorite show of 2021. So just go to rsr.org slash savants. But think of Annie Oakley. If nobody knows her story, you should go just watch a video on her. How she was this dead eye shot. This guy from Europe comes over to the country, he's taking tours, and he happens to go through this small town in either Kentucky or Tennessee. And Annie Oakley lived there, and somebody mentioned, oh, you know, there's somebody here that can do better than you. And he goes, oh, yeah, right. He, he thought he was the best in the world. So he had a competition with her, and I think they were at 27 shots on that shot put thing. And he finally missed, and she, she made the next shot. And he asked her, were you nervous or anything? And she said, no, I, I was going to make the next however thousand, you know. She could shoot a card, a deck of cards, take one card out of a deck of cards, you hold it, and I can't remember the distance. She would split the card with the card facing this way, not just the card. She was incredible. The guy that was the dead eye shot that she defeated, they ended up getting married. So kind of an interesting story. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So this uh, John Eccles, he won the Nobel Prize for Medicine in physiology in 1963. He wrote the following in 1984 at the age of 81. We regard materialism to be a superstition without rational foundation. The more we discover between mental phenomena and the more wonderful do both the brain events and the mental phenomena become. Promissory materialism is simply religious belief held by dogmatic materialism. This is a guy who won a Nobel Prize for it. He did some of these studies, you know, on the brain and the consciousness. Okay, so another show we did in April, I really enjoyed this one. It was on Cosmic Rays, and this was with guest host Daniel Hedrick. Daniel was instrumental in a lot of shows this last year, and we'll have him back next year, I'm sure, for various shows. So, you know, what was interesting about this show, um, if you give me one second here, um, there is a, there's a YouTube channel and it's, it's Veritasim. Some of, some of you have probably seen this channel. Um, it had a, it had a show called is the universe hostile to computers. And what, what this story here is that I'm showing you up here is a supernova helped an, a politician win an election. So this politician in Belgium, she won by 1024 votes more than you know, if you looked at the number of votes you got, it was 1024 more. And if you're a computer scientist, computer engineer, you know what that sounds like about the eighth bit over, you know, in the hex hexadecimal. They eventually figured out it was due to cosmic rays, caused a bit flip, because she won more votes than she could possibly win. So they figured it out to cosmic rays. Uh, it's a phenomenon that's been studied for a long time. I work at Micron and we have to deal with, you know, the bit flips that occur. And I, in fact, I have worked in the error mitigation, mitigation group. We have to deal with things like quantum tunneling and various things like that. So cosmic rays are real. So to give you another idea about cosmic rays, at sea level, the majority of cosmic ray secondaries are highly penetrating muons. About 10,000 muons pass through our bodies, bodies every minute. So, for, you know, last 10 minutes, I've had 100,000 of these things go through my body and yours too. Some of these muons will ionize mo molecules as they go through our flesh, occasionally leading to genetic mutations that may be harmful. At present, the average human receives the equivalent of about 10 chest x-rays per year from cosmic rays. So, there you go. Okay. Now, here's where we got to have our fake science alert and we have to pull out our baloney detector. Because then the article says, indeed, sometimes ray-induced mutations may sometimes be beneficial. So they're trying to, oh, maybe this is what helps us with evolution. So that's nonsense. And we could go into a whole other topic about beneficial so-called mutations. Um, when we research the uh, scientific uh, journals, you don't find any. The ones you find that are claimed to be beneficial, 
really represented a loss of, of information. Okay, so here's another real science news. Fred, Fred wins dog catcher in Boulder by 1 million votes, and there's only like 100,000 people in Boulder. So the only way I win dog catcher in Boulder is with a bit flip. Okay, this was another really fun interview that we had. This was in April. We interviewed Dr. Nathaniel Jensen. Oh, gotcha. Okay. So we interviewed Dr. Nathaniel Jensen. So he now works for ICR. He got his PhD in developmental, developmental biology from Harvard. So this guy uh, got a, he's a really bright guy. I really enjoyed doing this interview. Okay, so some of the things that he found, one of the big takeaways from his talk is that, uh, um, Ancestry, if you look at how right now, if you go to get your DNA test, a lot of people like to do that. They like to see who their ancestors are. A funny story, my uh, um, nephew, he's been told for years, and we've been told that he's part Indian because he, my, my brother's girlfriend at the time, they had Blake, and she thought she, he, he looks Indian. He kind of has like a Middle Eastern look or an Indian look. So he had a party and he was going to do a DNA reveal because he went to like one of these places where you can have your DNAs checked. He found out he was like 0 0.001 Indian. <laughs> so what I found out from Dr. Nathaniel Jensen, one of the things from his talk is that these genealogy tests that you're doing when you go to have that done, they're only accurate back to about four to five generations. And the reason is, is because every time you go back a generation, your, your sampling is getting more diluted. And so I just wanted to show this chart. I hope it makes sense. So if you think there's you, you've got your DNA is 100% you. Okay, so your parents would have 50%, right? Because you're getting 50%, one, one half of your genes from your dad, another half from your mom. And when you look at genetics, Mitochondria passes through the mom and Y chromosome passes through the father. And so these genetic tests, they use both the Y chromosome and mitochondrial studies to determine this. So now if you go to your grandparents, they're gonna have 25% of the DNA because you know it's exponential. You go back to your great great grandparents, it goes down to 6.25. And then your great 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 grandparents, there's only 3.12% DNA. So it becomes more difficult as you get back to that fourth and fifth generation to really know who you're related to. A lot of people don't realize that, and I'm not sure they tell that little trade secret to people. So here's some major bullet points. There's messy interconnectedness. We are likely traced back to all three of Noah's sons. The Israelites can trace their heritage back to Noah himself via Noah's son Shem. These chapters record a precise, specific number of generations from the flood down to Abraham. The DNA based tree contains a near exact match to this family tree structure. This is what Nathaniel Jensen found, and he covers it in his book. And I highly recommend his book. It's not always the easiest thing to read, but it's a great resource. If you want to see who you might be, who your chain is, your ancestry is, you can actually use this book to look back in that. He uses the Y chromosome, so you're not going to have as much noise that comes with the one that this, this uh, reports that you get from like ancestry.com. Okay, and all the nations of the world trace back ancestry back to the names listed in Genesis 10. Isn't that interesting? That's what his findings show. Using the Y chromosome, everything traces back to those nations mentioned in, in Genesis 10. So the timeline evidence, it's powerful evidence for recent origin of humanity. It's, it's undeniable. And here... I have a real interesting part of that coming up. <laughs> okay. Thank you, though. But thanks for bringing that up. But yeah, I do have a, a bit on that. So then there, he also mentioned, and you think about it, there's historical anchor, anchors, which means when he looks at the Y chromosome and he maps all this stuff out, it matches events in history, such as the Great Wandering. So when the Huns had attacked and conquered Europe, pretty much, you have this huge scattering. 
Well, you see a lot of this migration that happened to America and, you know, into Central Asia, it matches this pretty closely. And you've got other anchors in time that match. And so that's just another piece of evidence for, for this data. Okay, so now we're gonna do a quick run through on the Bible and genetics and we'll get to the mitochondria. So again, I mentioned Y chromosome male inheritance. There's no variation found in non-coding introns. Why this is important is, you know, the introns make up a huge part of the chromosome. Introns do a lot of, uh, they provide a lot of structural information to building a protein. It also the binding switches, like how much protein should I make? It's not a coding section, but it provides a code. Thank you. Is this better? Yes. Okay. Oh, I got you. Yes. Okay. See what I was doing. All right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And all men trace back to a single male ancestor. That's what we find when we look at. The Y chromosome. One other thing about the Y chromosome that I love is when they finally had the full sequence of the Y chromosome for humans and chimps, you think, what a great way to prove evolution. Because as I mentioned earlier, the Y chromosome doesn't change much. It's very what's called conserved. So in biology will call it very conserved. It doesn't change much. So if we're related to chimps, then our chromosome Y, our Y chromosome should be very similar to chimps. If we're related to them, right? Common ancestor, they don't change much. So the Y chromosome through the line going up to human for this common ancestor and the Y chromosome to go into chimps. Guess what the scientists found out when they actually finally got a chance to sequence the human and the chimp Y chromosome? They were 30 to 47% different. You know what the scientist said who made that discovery and reported it, I think it was Nature Magazine? He said the difference was horrendous. My question is, is horrendous a scientific term? <laughs> or is it a religious term? So the white chromosome is powerful evidence that man is not related to chimps in any way. Okay, then there's mitochondrial DNA, which is super cool. It has female inheritance. And there's four main groups of variation found. You get debates between three and four, but we're going to get into this because I think you're going to find it super fascinating. This is a discovery from... Bob would say Real Science Radio, but Bob in here came up with this uh, idea, and I think it's fantastic, and I think it's correct. So mitochondrial DNA also goes back to one mitochondrial Eve. That's even in the secular journals. In fact, if you look at it, when this was reported in science, they reported this appears to mutate much faster than expected. When they were able to get more samples of mitochondrial DNA from the Volmanoff family, when they looked at their DNA, mitochondrial, they got a lot more data, and this is what they found. This is Dr. Ann Gibbons reporting this in Science Magazine. This is not, you know, some young Earth creationist uh, media here. Regardless of the cause, evolutionists are most concerned about the effect of a faster mutation rate. For example, researchers have calculated that mitochondrial Eve, the woman whose mitochondrial DNA was ancestral to that in all living people, lived 100 to 200,000 years ago in Africa. That's what they thought. Now they have this new data. Using the new clock, she would be a mere 6,000 years old. <laughs> Does that sound like something we would uh, recognize right away? 6,000 years. And then the very next sentence that I don't show here is, oh, but that can't be the case. How did they solve this problem? The evolutionists, this is devastating to them. They eventually said, oh, we figured out how she really is 200,000 years old. They mixed chimp DNA with human DNA to do their analysis. So they're assuming human and chimp chimp some ancestry, and then they run their data. That's total circular reasoning. It's totally bogus. It's, it's deceptive. They know, they know they're doing that. So I'll just quickly try to describe this slide here. Um, so when you look at what's expected with the mitochondrial DNA differences, you'd expect about this range, if you had this many years go by 180,000, after about 10,000 years, your range would be right about here. So when they finally were able to look at the differences, look what they found. Which does this match better? It matches a young year. I'd say an older, I think 6,000 years is really old, but it matches this predictive value right here. Same with fruit flies, same with roundworms. The number of mitochondrial DNA differences that we find matches these organisms, roundworms and uh, fruit flies, being within 10,000 years or less, because notice how it's even a little bit less. So we, we can say less than that. 
Definitely not the 20 million years here or the 18 million years here predicted, or the 180,000 years here predicted for humans. Okay. So our advanced understanding of DNA reduces the amount of races accepted to scientists to three. So you get either three or four, okay? They think there's three major people groups. So now I want to take a look. I think there's, Bob Inyard came up with this idea. He thinks there's four. And it's interesting that the secular world will say three or four. So now I'm going to read this uh, Bible passage from Genesis 9. Now the sons of Noah who went out of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Okay, there's your three, right? Three men with three wives who passed down their mitochondria. These three were the sons of Noah, and from these the whole earth was populated. These three, okay. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, Indeed, the people are one, and they all have one language. Come, let us go down there, go down and confuse their language that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of the earth, and they ceased building the city. So the Tower of Babel and, and the spread of people through the nations, as we all know that story. These were the families of the sons of Noah, according to their generations in their nations, and from these, the nations were divided on the earth after the flood. So everything's coming down, and I could show you genealogy charts from the three sons of Noah, but those were the three. So if you look at the encyclopedia, if you look at the Wikipedia in their evolutionary tree, you can kind of see three major groups here. And really what you see, you have four, but they try to lump that, the, uh, this group here. A lot, a lot of them will say, well, this group really is this one big group here. We think that this is actually a fourth distinct group, and I'll, I'll explain why, from the Bible. And here's an interesting thing on this whole thing with Nathaniel Jameson. I just told you that we've been talking about our interview with him. Rob Carter, who's been working with the mitochondrial DNA, Dr. Rob Carter at CMI, he's been working with the mitochondrial DNA. Well, he wrote a review of Nathaniel's book. And he said this, that this necessitates that some lineages have a higher mutation rate today, or at least have a higher mutation rate in the past. Since the most discordant lineages are in Africa, he appears to be saying that some Africans are more mute than non-Africans. So he's getting into this argument. He doesn't want to use four people groups. He's afraid it will not be politically correct. But I want to say up, just up front, the amount of changes and mutations between any two humans is very small. I mean, we're like 99.8% similar, similar. So there's no none of that type of connotation. And Rob Carter goes on to say what it needs to be said because this is what the data shows. So if you look at something that happened in the Bible, we can see that there were four groups. In a moral act from Leviticus 18, before we get to the flood, I want to give you a clue, a key in the Bible so you can decipher other keys because God talks about something in a very polite way. None of you shall approach anyone near of kin to uncover nakedness. I am the Lord. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your father, which is the nakedness of your brother. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your father's wife. It is the nakedness of your father. And here's the key. The man who lies with his father's wife has uncovered his father's nakedness. It's, a, it's God's providing a polite way of how he's describing this incest. It's right here. And there's other places in the Bible where this same key is made that uncovering your father's your your father's nakedness means you slept with your mom i mean that's what it means if you uncover your uncle's nakedness that's saying in a polite way that you slept with his wife your aunt and, and god gives these examples in the bible this isn't the only one i just want to give you one so now go let's go look and see why canaan was cursed then he drank of wine and was drunk and he came uncovered in his tent and ham the father of canaan saw the nakedness of his father. So what is that telling us? If we can believe the other parts of the Bible, where God says, you know, cover the nakedness of your father, that means you slept with your mom. And told his two brothers outside, but Shem and Japheth took a garment, laid it on both their shoulders, and went backward and covered the nakedness of their father. They covered their mother. Their faces were turned away, and they did not see their father's nakedness. So Noah awoke from his wine, 
and knew what his younger son had done to him. Then he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants he shall be to his brethren. So I, you know, before I did the radio show, I spent many years debating evolutionists on a fairly frequent basis, you know, all the time. And one of the criticisms they would make of the Bible is, why would God, or why would Noah curse his son, or curse Canaan for something simply because Ham saw his dad naked? It's like, that's really weird. I mean, why would that be a big deal? You see your dad naked and you're gonna curse his son. Well, now we know why. This makes perfect sense because Ham had done an immoral act and he slept with his, his, uh, Noah's uh, wife, his mother. Now the sons of Noah who went out of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Interesting that in the Bible it says, and Ham was the father of Canaan. I mean, why insert that there? These three were the sons of Noah, and from these, the whole earth was populated. So why is Canaan mentioned here? And then if you consider what is a curse, and why Noah said Canaan's cursed, he's not saying, hey, you did something wrong, because you're not responsible for the sins of your father. He's cursed in the sense that it, just incest. Canaan had his grandmother for a mother, his grandfather for an uncle, his mother for a great aunt, his father for a cousin, and worst of all, his brother for a father, his half brother, that is. So think of the life he's going to lead. You, things don't change under the sun. You don't think people are going to make fun of him? And it, it, it was his line was cursed in that regard. And then, you know, the origin of the worldwide taboo against incest, I think we can trace it back to this true story of a tragic reality of a child being set up to fail by the wickedness of his father. So that's RSR's take on, we think there's four major people groups and one of them is from the line that Ham established through Canaan because of his incestual relationship with his mom. And so there's even scientific evidence. Why is there this fuzzy thing between three and four groups? I think we can make a biblical argument of what happened there. And if you want to know more about that, go to rsr.org slash Canaan, C-A-N-A-A-N, and you can read Bob Inyard's full account of it. It's far more detailed, far, very interesting. I think he makes a very strong case. Okay, we had a really kind of a fun show and a controversial show. I don't think anyone was too upset. Uh, it's whether or not dogs go to heaven. <laughs> We had a lot of feedback on this show. And uh, we, you know, we say at Real Science Radio, we take a position, but we can't be dogmatic on it. Sorry for the pun. <laughs> <laughs> you can't, we don't know for certain. Nobody does. There's not enough biblical text to make a definitive statement. But we'll show you the pluses and minuses, you know, the arguments for and against. But first, we need to establish that we do know that all cats go to hell. <laughs> Okay, the case four. That's actually a, a dog of mine that I once owned. We don't anymore because unfortunately my wife's allergic. But here's a case four. So God rebukes Jonah for being upset that God spared Nineveh. And he tells Jonah, should I not pity Nineveh, that, that great city in which are more than 120,000 persons who cannot discern between their right and hand and their left? That means there's that many young people who don't know the law yet before the age of accountability. You know, Paul said, I was alive until I became aware of the law. And once I became aware of the law, I was dead. Well, obviously he's talking spiritually because he just didn't plot down dead. So the Bible must be referring to the young. And it, it also notes that he says, um, and much livestock and the animals. So why, you know, you're upset that I spared Nineveh, but yet all these young people are being spared and so are the livestock. The case four, so we got this email from a listener. And it's kind of funny, so I just went ahead and threw it into this talk. As to the question of whether dogs go to heaven or not, I think we need to first define heaven. According to Genesis 1, 6 to 8, God created the firmament and called it heaven. And according to the hydroplate theory, and Real Science Radio agrees with this, the firmament is the crust of the earth, the one that was discussed in Genesis 1, 6 to 8. And according to Ecclesiastes 3, verse 21, who knoweth the spirit of man that goes upward and the spirit of the beast that goes downward to the earth? So it was interesting when I read that, I thought, okay, it's actually against your point. It kind of argues that dogs don't go to heaven, but he went on to say this. And I appreciate this from David Inslee from Lake, Lake Land, Florida. 
Well, if the spirit of the beast dogs, I think, would be included, goes to the earth, and if the firmament is a crust of the earth and called by God heaven, then I would have to conclude that dogs do indeed go to heaven. <laughs> As for cats, yes, they are also in heaven. Where else would the heart strings come from? <laughs> <laughs> And he said that last bit was a shamelessly stole that from Chuck Missler. And if you remember Chuck Missler, he was awesome. Here's the case against. I can't remember where I had heard this from, but I, I think it's, uh, it may, it's a pretty good case against, actually, I think. But that's just me. I could be wrong. I'm not being dogmatic. In, in the book of Job, there was a man in the land of us. Am I saying that right? Is it us? Okay, good enough. Whose name was Job, I've been saying job my whole life, but I still have occasionally slip up. And that man was blameless and upright, and one who feared God and shunned evil. And seven sons and three daughters were born to him. Also, his possessions were 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female darkies, a very large household. So that man, so that this man was the greatest of all in the people of the East. So after Job loses everything, I did. See, I told you, Job, after he lost everything. And we all know the story, I'm assuming most of you do, is all his livestock got wiped out, is all his uh, kids were killed. When God comes back, and I love the end of Job, but doesn't everybody, who doesn't want the end of Job? And I'm not sure I want to experience that the way Job did, I mean, but it'd be super cool too in a lot of ways. Indeed, the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. And now the Lord blessed the later the latter days of Job, Job more than his beginning, for he had 14,000 sheep, compare that to the 7,000, 6,000 camels, compare that to the 3,000, and 1,000 yoke of oxen, and one other, and 1,000 female donkeys, all double the animals, right? So then he should get double the offspring, right? And he also had seven sons and three daughters. So his seven sons and three daughters, he didn't double them. He didn't need to because they're eternal and they're in heaven. That is an argument against animals going to heaven, pets going to heaven. Because in this case, the God doubled. If they were actually in heaven, all these this offspring, why would he need to double them here? He didn't need to double the offspring because then you'd really be tripling his offspring because you, you got to remember people are created to live for eternity. That's the argument against. Again, one cannot be dogmatic. I love these verses that Doug shared with the radio audience. The eye has not seen, nor the ear heard, nor have entered in the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love them. And the verse in Isaiah upon which Paul's message is based is from Isaiah chapter 65, verse 17. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered or come to mind. Things are going to be so great that you know, we'll, we'll, you know, maybe our pets will be in heaven. But just reflect on this this verse here, and if they're not, it sounds like it's not going to bother you. You won't even remember it because things will be so great. Okay, so Ryan and I, my son, we do the Creation Magazine shows. He joins me on air to go through these. It's a lot of fun. We think Creation Magazine is the best publication by the major creation groups. Creation Ministries International. And so we always go through their focus section. We'll go through some of the articles and we just pick out the ones we like the best. So I pulled this one out because I didn't really think this one's cool. It's called the Stargazer. That's an actual picture of this fish and he buries himself in the substrate. So I'm going to show you a video of this guy because, you know, he likes to bury himself underneath and you just see his eyes and his eyes can be like periscopes. So here's an example. Let's see if this actually works here. I need to add the volume. Species of stargazers come equipped with lures to help them snag prey. These resemble worms that are attached to a fishing rod like appendage on their lower lip. If you look closely at their mouths, you'll see that they kind of look like zippers. In fact, the mouth of the stargazer is interlocked with tiny bristles which prevent sand from falling into their mouths when they're buried. A system that works about as well as it can, but still lets some sand in when they open their mouths to grab dinner. But stargazers have a second lure as well. This one is their specialized gills. It will discharge seawater next to their pectoral fin, which causes the sand to swirl around a bit as if there was a very small fish present. 
When a larger fish comes to check it out, the stargazer opens up its mouth and snaps it up. They will also use their eyes to lure it prey. Once a small fish is almost in range, the stargazer will rotate one of their contralateral eyes in order to give the impression that a small burrowing creature is there. This will draw in a curious fish before, you know, as if these little monsters didn't have enough going for them. Some species, like the Black Sea Stargazer or Uranoscopus Faber, comes equipped with the ability to create acoustic pulses. They can emit a low frequency acoustic discharge between five and 10 hertz, just below the human hearing threshold, which researchers believe they use to stun prey and attract mates. Funny how those two abilities often coincide, isn't it? What do you want me to talk about next? Please look. So the, the thing that wasn't mentioned in this video is they also have electrical sense, uh, some kind of electrical mechanism behind their eyes and they can zap about 50 volts in the prey. So it kind of reminds me of us, uh, this is dating me, but the second Superman movie with the little bad guys with the lasers coming out of their eyes. So this guy kind of does that. And he's also poisonous too, by the way. He also has a toxin, so you don't want to step on him. So not a, not a neat dude, he's definitely a monster. But you know, after the fall, he was equipped to do this stuff. We also call, covered a show with uh, so some of these really scary animals or creatures, insects, you know, scorpion, a bat, you know, all of these creatures have their venom is now used, being used in treatments for things like stroke, helping to identify, illuminate uh, like tumors and things like that. So the medical community is finding a lot of use for these. Um, and so now here's, let me see how I'm doing time-wise. Okay. so. This is close to the last, but this is a lot here. And I, this is my favorite show of the year. I really loved going through Barry Satterfield's Cosmology. Uh, Real Science Radio doesn't officially endorse it, but we think it might be the closest thing. And basically, the question that we're trying to answer is, how do we see distant starlight? Because there's really three, maybe three major arguments out there, three or four. You know, you have Russ Humphreys. He had one on using special relativity to try to explain how we see this in starlight. That one fell out of favor and now he's using it. He's trying to come up with a different model that's actively being discussed on CRSNet. Um, Jason Lyle has a model where Einstein's equations allow the speed of light to be infinite in one direction. I won't get into the details of that. There's of course, that, uh, you know, there's things like tired light and other examples. But I want to give you Barry Satterfield's and his is but some people say it's CDK, the, the, the decay of the speed of light. But I misunderstood that. So this is a really ser good series to go through because it cleared some things up for me. And I think after you see this, you might, uh, like me, when I saw the evidence, I, okay, this one probably has the best chance of being correct. So in order to do this, I have to cover a couple of basic concepts. So we're gonna look at uh, plasma. And hopefully this won't be too much. And then we're going to look at electromagnetism versus gravity and our dark matter, dark energy real. Was the speed of light slow in the past? What is zero point energy? That's related to that topic. And then how do we know the universe is expanding? And then finally, underneath that, our quantum, quantized redshift is a smoking gun. And that, that's this last piece here when I get to it. That's why I think Barry, Barry Satterfield's theory needs another serious look in creation world. So first, what is plasma? Now, this is nothing that's disputed by anybody. It's one of the four fundamental states of matter, sol solid, liquid, gas, and then there's plasma. And basically, it contains a significant portion of charged particles, ions or, or electrons. So for, here's examples of plasma here, lightning, you know, neon light, you know, these plasma things you can buy. So, it, and it represents 99% of all matter in the universe. That's what plasma represents according to the secular world. Can, it can be generated by subjecting it to a strong electromagnetic field. That's kind of important, but let me just try to get into the very basics of this. So here's an image from the secular science. They think most of the universe is dark energy and dark matter. They think a very small part of the universe is matter. 
And of this small part of matter right here, that 4%, 99% of that is plasma. And then you have a small percent of neutrinos. Okay. So the gravity-based model, that's the secular model, and it's the model accepted currently by most creationists, which I think is unfortunate, but we don't have, I'll, I'll just be honest, be honest with you, we don't have a lot of astrophysicists in creation science, and the ones we do, they don't get peer-reviewed by engineers. I'm going to explain that in a second, because to me it's important. So here's the problem with the gravity-based model. So when you look at the orbital speed of these objects in a galaxy, and those could be anything, you know, like red giants, you know, satellite galaxies, all these things that are part of a large galaxy. When they look at the uh, what you'd expect for their, their orbital, you know, there's the, the speed of their, uh, how they orbit around the center of that large galaxies. This is what's expected, right? Because as you get farther away, you have less gravity to work on it. Gravity is a very weak force, very weak. Electromagnetism, magnetism is a very, very strong force, trillions of times stronger than the force of gravity. It's a weak force. So this is what we actually observe. As you get farther out, why are these things so tightly, you know, as if there's some gravity is what they think allowing this to happen. There must be more gravity because this is what we observe. We'd expect this because gravity should be getting weaker. That's where they come up with dark matter. They made up dark matter to solve this problem. That's the reason for dark matter, the biggest reason. Okay, interesting. If you look at plasma in the lab where they run simulations, in the early 1980s, Anthony L. Peratt, a student of Alvin's. Now, Alvin, he was a guy who won the Nobel Prize for his work on plasma cosmology because he believes, he doesn't believe gal uh, galaxies are being manipulated by gravity because there's no evidence for it. That's why they come up with dark matter. He used supercomputer facilities at uh, Maxwell Laboratories and later at Los Alamos to simulate Alvin, who is the father of plasma cosmology, their concept of galaxies being formed by primordial clouds of plasma spinning in a magnetic fil filament. So they actually can create small form, these formations using electromagnetism in the lab. They can do that. And they don't need gravity to do it. And they can do it easily. So here's what Dr. Donald Scott said. This, this 85-year quest for dark matter explanation of gap Galactic stellar rotation profiles has produced only null results. In other words, there's no evidence. Inserting a galaxy's charge density profile into the Berkman current vessel function model now provides an eloquently simple answer. The plasma model shows that the that observed stellar velocity profiles of galaxies are now accurately predicted without invocations of dark matter. So there is a community in the secular world that is pushing plasma and electromagnetism as the force that explains how we see these. Okay. This is the, to get to the point about you know, astronomers and astrophysicists. Here's what Nobel Prize winner Hans Alvin said. He's the father of plasma cosmology. A study of how a number of the most used textbooks in astrophysics treat important concepts such as double layers, critical velocity, pitch effects, and circuits is made. It is found that students using these textbooks remain essentially ignorant of even the existence of these concepts, despite the fact that some of them have been well known for half a century. And I want to explain that a little bit better when we go look at Daniel, Dr. Danny Faulkner, who's the creationist astronomer, um, and he works for Answers in Genesis. He's done a lot of great things over the years for the Young Earth Movement. But here's what he wrote when he criticized this guy's book and this Scott, he's a PhD in electrical engineering. And he wrote books on electrical engineering. He knows what he's talking about. He said that he, he had this criticism of his book and he had many others. And um, Joe Spears who was on the air for this topic. He has an entire paper that's almost as long as Danny Faulkner's paper. And Danny Faulkner makes, unfortunately, a ton of errors in his paper, but it's because of his lack of knowledge of electrical engineering. 
and he was probably the only one that they asked to take on this plasma cosmology. I'm sure Answers of Genesis asked him to write an article, but they had no electrical engineers or any engineers to peer review his paper because his paper's wrong. And here's an example. There's two. And this, this one uh, statement alone, there's two problems. He says on page 22, Scott attempted to show how magnetic fields predominate over gravity by pointing out that a small magnet can lift a ball bearing against gravity. Left unsaid is that this works only if the material under consideration is ferromagnetic, and it requires a considerable magnetic field. It does not require a considerable magnetic field. Just consider this. And Joe Spears himself actually came up with this. There's a lot of cool analogies. I, I like his the best. Whenever you're at a restaurant, if you like soap and you get the crackers and the little cellophane wrappers, and you take the crackers out, a lot of times those cellophane wrappers will stick to your fingers. It's because of static electricity. So the magnetic field that has been formed there with the static electricity, that magnetic field is stronger than the entire force of the gravity of the entire Earth pulling down on it. The magnetic fields are trillions and trillions and trillions of times stronger than gravity, which is a weak force. So it's astonishing, actually, that the statement was made, and then he said, however, much of the matter in space is not ferromagnetic. He doesn't understand. He thinks that not everything is a magnet. You don't need a magnet to have magnetism. A basic concept of electrical engineering is all you need is a flowing current. Any flowing current will form a magnetic field. And we have, and uh, at some point, Joe Spears is still working on polishing up his paper. He gives plenty of examples from the secular science of all these electric current fields that they're finding in the universe. So you've got magnetic fields everywhere. So there's a really a, a misunderstanding in both the secular community doesn't want to give up on the gravity model and the creation community doesn't, I do not believe has the right, there are enough people to help peer review and look at these things. Okay. So the next concept we need to look at before I get to the punchline is was the speed of light slower in the past? Now, before I show you this, I just want you to know that Barry Satterfield isn't saying that the speed of light is like, it's like decaying, you know, it's getting weaker or through time, it just slows down. He's not saying that, we, he still believes that the speed of light is the same in vacuum. The, you know, it's constant in a vacuum, but there is overwhelming evidence through history, very accurate measurements. It wasn't like these guys were clowns who measured this in the past. And I want to want you to watch this video of evidence of the speed of light slower in the past as it comes to Earth. I would spend a few moments on the constants of nature too, because these are again used assumed to be constant. Things like the gravitational constant, the speed of light, are called the fundamental constants. Are they really constant? Well, when I got interested in this question, I tried to find out. Uh, I, they're given in physics handbooks. Handbooks of physics list the existing fundamental constants, tell you their value. But I wanted to see if they changed. So I got the old volumes of physical handbooks. I went to the patent office library here in London, and uh, they're the only place I could find that kept the old volumes. You know, normally people throw them away when the new values come out. Uh, they throw away the old ones. When I did this, I found that the speed of light dropped between 1928 and 1945 by about 20 kilometers per second. It's a huge drop because they're given with errors of any fractions of a set, uh, fra decimal points of error. And yet, all over the world, it dropped, and they were all getting values very similar to each other with tiny errors. And then in 1945, it went up in 48, it went up again. And um, then people started getting very similar values again. I was very intrigued by this, and I couldn't make sense of it. So I went to see the head of metrology at the National Physical Laboratory in Teddington. Um, metrology is the science in which people measure constants. And I asked him about this. I said, what do you make of this drop in the speed of light between 1928 and 1945? And he said, oh dear, he said, you've uncovered uh, the most embarrassing episode in the history of our science. So I said, well, could the speed of light have actually dropped? And that would have amazing implications if so. He said, no, no, of course it couldn't have actually dropped. It's a constant. 
So, oh, uh, well then, how do you explain the fact everyone was finding it going much slower during that period? Is it because they were fudging their results to get what they thought other people should be getting and the whole thing was just produced by in the minds of physicists? Um, he said, we don't like to use the word fudge. I said, well, what do you prefer? He said, well, uh, we prefer to call it intellectual phase locking. <laughs> so I said, well, if it was going on then, how can we say sure it's not going on today? And that the, the present values are produced by intellectual phase locking. And he said, oh, we know that's not the case. And I said, how do we know? He said, well, he said, well, we've solved the problem. And I said, well, how? He said, well, we fixed the speed of light by definition in 1972. So I said, but it might still change. He said, yes, but we'd never know it because we've defined the meter in terms of the speed of light. So the units had changed with it. So he looked very pleased about that. They'd fixed their problem. <laughs> but I said, well, then what about big G? So that particular TED talk, by the way, was banned from TED talk. <laughs> He's uh, Dr. Sheldrake, and he's, you know, he's a brilliant guy. He's a secular scientist, but um, it's, you know, it, it's super interesting that a lot of people don't know that. We won't ever know that the speed of light changed anymore because they tied it to the meter. So kind of a gross analogy would be is if I brought out something, I'd say, this is two feet, and they're like, no, it isn't. And then they give their ruler and they show, see, this is one foot. And then I give them my ruler that's been changed and it's a two foot ruler. It says, no, my ruler says it's two feet. So I want the bet pay up. So they changed the meat. The, the speed of light is now tied to the meter. So you can never detect the change in speed of light. Okay. So I'm getting to why this is important. So I mentioned earlier, Setterfield does not question C as a constant in a vacuum, but let's consider the vacuum of space. Physicists know about this phenomenon called zero point energy. It's the energy that remains when all other energy is removed from the system. So the vacuum of space is not completely empty. And secular scientists know this. They don't claim it's completely empty. So light does slow down through various mediums, such as water or glass. We know that scientifically. That's just the way it is. So why was C slowing down before it was fixed in 1972? Well, that's where Barry Satterfield came up with this theory that it's because of the zero point energy. What if at creation you had a lot less zero point energy? So it was a lot less dense, and then God stretches out the heavens. And when you do stretch something out, you're you're adding power and energy like this power and energy like a rubber band. You're stretching out the energy, and so as he's stretching out space, the vacuum. The zero point energy in the vacuum is increasing. And so therefore, light will travel, travel slower through it. So think of the vacuum, the zero point energy in the vacuum of like an ocean or waves and then they peak up every here, here, here and there and then it goes away. There are virtual particles that come, in, come into existence and they go out of existence. This isn't, I'm not mentioning something here that Barry Satterfield came up with. This is all from the secular sciences. So everybody knows and agrees that the vacuum isn't completely empty. What's the zero point energy? If the zero point energy, which was much lower in the past, then that means the speed of light would travel faster in the past because it's traveling through a medium that has fewer obstructions. With these virtual particles popping in and out of existence, it can bend slow down the speed of light. So God stretched out the heavens. The zero point energy dense, density is lower in the beginning. Light was much faster in the beginning. As the heavens stretched and energy produced, the vacuum zero point density increased. That's all. That sounds really cool. Sounds like an interesting theory, but can you really buy into it? Not really yet, because I, I'm like, well, this is interesting. It's definitely a possibility. Now, Barry Satterfield has some, some data, and this guy's brilliant. You can go read his papers. It's not like this guy's not a slouch. He's a brilliant. That Stanford commissioned him to do the speed of light measurements. Him and another guy, a mathematician from Australia. This guy's a serious scientist, and he should be taken seriously. He came up with something that I want to show you that, if true, it pretty much makes this the best argument and likely argument. But it'd be nice if somebody in the creation movement who has, 
you know, a lot more experience than I do or whoever else to research this work because a lot of people misunderstand Barry Serafield's web work in saying that the speed of light isn't constant. He's not, he didn't say that. So what about quantized redshift? So now we're getting to the punchline of the story. So if you've heard this argument before, scientists, secular scientists have noticed that as you go farther out from Earth, that stars are falling along like a quantized area in space. Not, it's, you know, quantized, what that word means is instead of you're going, well, imagine walking up a ramp as opposed to steps. So quantized means you're taking steps in something there's incremental steps instead of a very you know, smooth path up, say, a ramp. You're, instead, you're going up steps. Here's what Halt and Arp said. The fact that measured values of redshift do not vary continuously but come in steps, certain preferred values, is so unexpected that conventional astronomy has never been able to accept it in spite of the overwhelming observational evidence. So here's a secular guy admitting that these redshifts are following quantized patterns. Why is that? One of the ways they explain this, the, the redshifts, is an expanding universe. The secular world says the universe is expanding. 95% of creation scientists agree that say, agree with them that the universe is expanding. Barry Satterfield says, no, the evidence says it's not expanding. In fact, the Bible says God stretched the heavens, not that he's stretching the heavens. And so what's the smoking gun? Lower vacuum energy means lower orbital electron energies and lower energy differences between orbitals. Emitted light does have longer wavelengths, resulting in redder light if the light was emitted in the early days of the universe. The redshift was present at the instant the light was emitted and started its journey to Earth. So it's not a Doppler effect. It's not a stretching of the heavens. The, red, the, the light was already redshift because that will happen when electrons change their orbits. It just, it will. So here's the, I'm finally getting to the smoking gun. When you look at in Bohr's model and it shows, his, his model shows electrons, you know, jumping from one, you know, one level to another and it's quantized. They never go in a ramp, they always go in steps. So when this happens, when this energy level changes, they go in steps. So what's interesting with what uh, Barry Setterfield has shown in his papers. So what he found was they match what we see when we look in space and we see the quantized riches. They match, the ratio matches exactly the ratios of orbital jumps in electrons. That's what he found. Now, if this is true, and I don't have the degree or the time or the expertise to prove this and go through this math. That would be a lot of work. But if he's right, and it'd be nice if someone would go through this, then this explains the quantized redshifts and the, the universe is not expanding. And it would be argument for the plasma, I believe, is the plasma, star, plasma cosmology. It all starts to make sense. There's so much more to Barry Setterfield's work that I encourage you to go to our website, rsr.org slash setterfield or rsr.org slash plasma. And we reference his papers there and you can go read more about it. He actually has predictions that show based on the stretching that you would actually be able to see the light. You know, you have stars created on day four and you have the light visible by day six, things like that. Now I, I, I didn't quite get into that, you can only absorb so much when you, I was also hearing this uh, theory in this detail for the first time. Okay, I'm about ready to wrap up. We did an interview today, and I wanted to show you real quickly. This is, we interviewed Daniel Kish. He's, some people have has referred to him as the Batman. He was born at age, about a year and three months. He had cancer with both eyes, and he's been blind for most of his life. He uses echolocation perceptual mobility right. approach is finding tremendous success with thousands of people all over the world because we teach the visual brain how to see without need for eyes. These people are riding a mountain bike, playing soccer, or skateboarding. They seem like a breeze to most people, unless you see what they see. 
like you, you guys can see with your eyes and we um, can see with our ears. People who are blind um, are in some ways redeploying uh, the visual brain uh, in such a way that they are truly seeing and appreciating the world around them and that that visual brain does light up. So in many ways, uh, this fantastic additional computing power of the brain, which is used for vision, is being redeployed as a way of seeing the world um, in the mind's eye. I was able to identify where the things are and what are what are the clues to go anywhere in this world. So is blindness really the problem? Or is the problem more about how we approach blindness and how we regard blindness? So, you know, I asked him, how do you, are there different, he uses clicking, he clicks his tongue. And you can watch other YouTube videos of him. He'll be in an area where there's a bunch of pillars and he'll easily navigate through it without a stick. He just, but he uses his tongue. He can, and he says some people use clickers, there's different ways that they use. They've trained their mind to recognize the pitch and the pattern of the, of the, the sound that returns to know where they are. He can, there's a YouTube video of him riding a bike, you know, down the street. Um, so it's amazing what God has programmed into our minds, like that one guy said, that doctor there, about how the mind adjusts to use your ears to see, to see basically, to stimulate your, your visual cortex. And that's what's happening. And so Dr. Or Daniel Kishman, when we interviewed him, he said, you know, I can see, he, he can see basically three, three, 360 degrees. And he knows, you know, where things are. He would be able to detect, you know, like these objects here just by clicking and enough clicks. And he can figure all that out. Plus just the hearing in general. You know, they can hear a lot. They can hear through walls basically, whereas we can't. But they, their ears become so in tune. It really is amazing. Um, I wanted to, uh, one last thing I wanted to mention about echolocation. We have a show called On Echolocation. You go to rsr.org, guess what? echolocation and you can listen to the show or find out more of this data it, we did a really cool show two years ago about how they looked at 200 genes between bats and dolphins and what was amazing was that they found 200 genes that had been independently changed in the same way what does that mean i mean they always said that well we know that you have the bat which isn't related to the dolphin they can evolve they call it convergent evolution they, they converge on the same pattern they're relying on natural selection to do that, but they never had insight. They didn't have, they weren't able to scope down into the genetic level until here in recent time. Now we can look at the genetics and they never expected convergent evolution to happen at the genetic level because it makes evolution impossible. Here's what one scientist, Jeanette Genomist said about this finding, no family trees are entirely safe from the, these misleading effects because he's calling them misleading. And we currently have no way to deal with this. And so it's really easy to calculate the odds of 200 changes in the DNA to happen exactly in one animal and exactly in, a, in the other. And it's simply taking four of the 200 power. It's like if you, if you flip a coin 100 times, you know the odds by going two to the 100 times. You, so here you just take four of the 200 times. The odds are 2.6 to 10 to the 120th power. How big is that number? The number of particles in the universe is less than that, 10 to the 80th power. So it's a devastating blow to them, like so many things are in evolution. So I want to wrap up the show. I want to mention the guest host in 2022. These guys deserve a big thanks from the listening audience. And Doug and I like to thank them. Daniel Hendrick did, did quite a few shows with us, and we were going to love to have him on again in the future. Brian Williams, again, does the Creation Magazine shows with me, so he's on about every two, three months. Joe Spears did the show on Beckberry Centerfield Cosmology. Brian Lauer is an excellent speaker. We did a talk on the Great Reset. That was one that I wish I could have fit into the slides, but I'm hoping to get 
Rob to have him as a speaker next year. I think he'd be great. It's real interesting stuff. Brody Leach, another topic that was really good. He's done really good work on the Smithsonian um, human origins. You know, the, the uh, articles and uh, charts they have on that. So we did some shows on that. We're going to do another one with Brody probably in February. Tom Rogers did a show with Doug on the cell. And I'd like to thank Miranda Bracken for her. We interviewed Miranda and Simon for the youth conference that we had last year. And hopefully, well, I don't know, I'm hoping we do another one. So I appreciate these guest hosts on Real Science Radio. These are the guys behind the curtain Dominic Ginyard, he's the producer, editor, and really the boss. Jamie Schofield has, for years, has produced and edited uh, Real Science Radio. He's been a great help. Um, he's been in the booth, and a lot of times he edits at home right now. Brandon Glander is a new person we brought on as assistant producer. Larry Wolf, assistant producer, and he helps us coordinate with speakers if we need to get a hold of someone. He makes the effort to go do that. Joe Spears is, you know, so instrumental. He does, he did that show with us, but just the RSR research and planning. He's one of the smartest guys I know. And I, I'm just thrilled to have him helping us out. Nicole McBurney, Doug's daughter, she's really good with the, helping with the planning, the research, and she helps produce from uh, Doug's end. Scott Chamblin, Simon Chamblin, Michael Linyard, Nathaniel Linyard, and Perry Little have all been part of the research team and the planning team for future shows. So I just wanted to give a shout out to these individuals. So looking forward to next year, we're going to have a show on quantum mechanics. We'll interview uh, Rob Brown. He was going to do the interview with us before tonight. And so we'll definitely have him on before he appears in the February show to give a preview to what he'll talk about. We're going to have Ellen McCary on. She's wrote an excellent book on the problems with plate tectonics. And of course, we'll continue to have Ryan on. Uh, we're going to have Brody Leach back. We have a really cool show on the octopus coming up and so much more. And uh, we really appreciate your support and all everybody who listens in. Uh, and again, you know, for me and Doug McBurney, we thank everybody who listens. We've got somebody from Wisconsin, Michigan, Michigan that uh, is visiting in town. And boy, I really appreciate that. So you were probably looking forward to Rob Brown, but you got stuck with me. <laughs> so looking forward to have Rob Brown here. Uh, he was very sorry about it. He, he was getting better. I talked to him on Monday and he was just recovering, and, uh, and he's like, yeah, I have a bad cold or flu, and I thought to myself, man, I hope you don't have COVID, and so then we found out a couple of days later on Wednesday that he did test positive for COVID, and he didn't want to take a chance, even though he's feeling much better, he doesn't want to, which was right of him, so there's an irony behind this whole COVID, because, uh, you know, Bob Vineyard was going to give a hydroplate talk to Pike's Peak Creation and uh, our group, and he passed away from COVID, and uh, again, he's with the Lord, and uh, and then I was going to give a talk to Pikes Peak creation on the hydroplate theory, and I got COVID. So they had to postpone that. And now Rob Brown is going to going to give a talk on the hydroplate theory. And guess what? He got COVID. <laughs> so Rob, I think let's not do hydroplate talks for another couple of years until COVID. <laughs> so, anyways, I thank you everybody for uh, uh, listening in tonight and for being patient with and having to put up with a change of speaker. Really appreciate it. Check one, two. All right. Well, thank you, Fred. That was uh, awesome. Really interesting. Um, so my suggestion is that next time we have somebody who's going to speak on the hydroplate theory is that we get into concerted prayer because we know what is behind the COVID. And it's not God. Um, so um, given that, uh, let's start a question and answer session here. And uh, what we'll do is, if you have a question, um, comments are entertained as well. So if you have something you would like to say, um, let me know somehow, and I will bring this mic to you, and you can uh, and be sure and just speak into the mic kind of the way I'm doing it here. Speak over the mic this way so that, um, so that everybody can hear. And then, um, and then Fred won't have to re repeat the question. Uh, so with that, let us begin. If anybody has a question, let me know.
So where do you want me to go? You, you can stay at your seat, actually. Oh, but, but this is fine. She, right? oh, I'm feeling like I'm on the spot. <laughs> okay, um, Dr. Uh, Jensen, uh, he mentioned on the show when he was on uh, that uh, they had a way of um, more accurately measuring time frames for people groups when they traveled and wandered. And I'm wondering if there's been a lot more information on that, if the research has continued, if you know, or if you have them on again. Yeah, so um, Dr. Jensen, we, uh, on our show page, we provided a link where you could go provide your own DNA information. He's looking for as much, you know, other research and other people just to get on there and help be part of this project. I haven't checked to see where that's at, uh, it's you know been a busy year, but that's a great question. I think uh, I think next year we should try to have him on again and see where that's going because his work was fantastic. Uh, him and Rob Carter both done really good work with you know Rob is focused more on the mitochondrial DNA, even though Rob did do work on white chromosome also. But just Nathaniel's work is uh, there's a lot coming out of that, and for sure there's one thing for certain you know the origin of recent humanity that does not the evolutionary timeline at all. And they don't have arguments to refute what he's doing. So it's really interesting work. And again, rsr.org slash Jameson, G E A N S O N. Or you can just search for it on our page. Go to rsr.org and search for trade, you know, whatever, anything about DNA, or uh, if you remember his name, Dr. Nathaniel Jameson of Harvard. I'm kind of sad about your explanation about the dogs to go to heaven. <laughs> but anyway, I have a question about the Bible says every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. Every knee, not knees, but every knee will bow down. And explain it to me because the dogs are for the uh, for legs, for knees. I want to see my king in heaven. <laughs> Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I, I just want to say, I'm not a scientist, but I read my I study my Bible. Yeah. So um, I guess is, is the question that uh, um, dogs are going to heaven because they have needs. Is that what I think I heard? Or? <laughs> I just want you to explain it to me because that's yeah. what the Bible says. It doesn't say anything about you know whoever or human being. Yeah. You know. So I'm pretty certain. Um, you know, I'm not a uh, expert theologian where I, you know, I, I feel pretty good about my knowledge of the Bible, but you know, this is from what so many of us are, we're, uh, um, we're not, you know, theologically trained, but we read the Bible a lot. My take on that would be that that's a description of humans and that, you know, I would never, it would never occur to me that that would be anything other than, you know, people, we were made in God's image and we're the only thing, the only creature that were that was made in God's image. Um, so, <laughs> so I guess the problem I guess the problem I would have with that, and again, forgive me, I'm just thinking out loud. So, so what you're saying then is too bad for dolphins and birds and things that don't have knees. You have to have knees to go to heaven. <laughs> It's not so much a um, question, it's more of a comment on this topic. So years ago, I did a, just a self-study about things floating on the water and uh, how it occurred in the Bible. So Moses traveled on the water and he saved Israel. So let's get foreshadowed. In my mind, in what I've studied, it's a foreshadow of Christ. So Noah traveled in an ark and saved the seed of man. Jesus was the ark that walked on water and saved the soul of man. Most things in the Bible that you, that you see, it has a physical meaning, but it, more important, it has a spiritual meaning. So I see the whole thing of the ark, all land breathing animals, I believe will go to heaven. And that's my reasoning on that. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, thanks for, it, that's, um, no, that's, that's reasonable. I, I really do think that, uh, you know, um, 
Sometimes I say this, and I think it might offend people who don't like gambling, but I like to joke that if there's a casino in heaven and I get to go wager on our dogs in heaven before I find out, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wager that they're not, but I know that I'm taking a chance. Like the odds might be 50%. Or, you know what I mean? There's other things like, is Christ who he says he is? I'm going to have to be 100%. I mean, that's an easy. There's so many things we really know are true. That's one I don't know is true. I believe, this is what I believe. I think the odds are that our pets are in heaven. I hope they are. I mean, I, but that's why those verses that Doug McBurney brought up about heaven's going to be so wonderful. We're not going to remember our pets and everything, every, all the, but maybe we will. I don't know. And I don't want to be dogmatic. Well, even though I'm taking a position. There's plants. And there's flowers in heaven. Yeah. So yeah. Not? And there are, and you know what? There, there is the, the lamb lies down with the line and things yeah. like that. Now that gets into a whole nother theological debate I don't want to get into now. But let me tell a really quick story, and I hope I don't take too much time. So when I was at the Creation, uh, the Creation Ministries International, I was sitting at a table and I was telling this guy, well, you know, you meet different families and there are a guy and his son. And he mentions that, you know, I, you know, I own a coffee company. Um, you know, I started, we were, I was in engineering and I ended up just starting a small little coffee maker. I'm like, oh really? Yeah, there's this fantastic coffee that I love drinking. A friend of mine told me about from this place called Doors County. He was, oh yeah, that's my coffee. And I'm like, there's a point in the story. So the guy just, so I told him about Real Science Radio, told him about the hydroplate theory. We should surprise so many people don't know about that theory because the big groups don't teach it. You know, and by the way, sorry for another dovetail. Um, uh, what's his name? Uh, drawing a blank. One of the guys that, oh, I'm going to feel so bad that I forgot his name. He's at ICR. He was out there last night. He was uh, Guzla, Randy Guzla. He's allowed him. Um, Kevin Lee. Kevin Lee was allowed to present the hydroplate theory to ICR last night, which is fantastic. Fantastic news. So pray that that opens hearts. Randy Guzla is great. He's trying to get you know that to you know he's trying to incorporate i'm pretty sure his wife believes in how to play theory because kevin lee got a hold of her on a, on a safari and anyways why did i go into that dovetail at that meeting where people don't know about the hydroplay theory i told this coffee guy about the hydroplay theory and i told him about real science radio he sent me a gift that we just got in the mail two days ago of this fantastic 12 days of quick christmas coffee that you open up each day you get a pot of coffee he had your exact same argument. He wrote that in his letters. Like, man, I like your dog show, but I'm, and I'm glad you weren't too dogmatic about it. He used your same argument, and I respect it. I really do. I think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it'll be interesting to find out. You know, we'll find out someday. So sorry for that little very long dovetail. Thank you. Thank you. Why, why would God take the time to uh, gather all the animals? And help uh, Noah get the animals in the ship if they didn't work anything, or if they don't uh, deserve faith in heaven. Or anything. this is a question. Because I want to spend my time on some animals. It, to me, only uh, people were important. But I'm not God, so I don't know. <laughs> like I said. I'm not dogmatic on it, so I would be if I really thought it was overwhelming. If I thought the verses that I've used, there's other verses against animals being in heaven that we provide on the show. There's other verses for we, you know, I can't cover all that here. It was a fun show, and it's a, you know, it's obviously a controversial topic and hopefully a lighthearted topic. I fully admit that I, my, um, what I think is probably true, I think I could be wrong, you know. I only think I have a slight leaning towards. That's our question. Sure. Sorry. Um. So my other question is um about the uh, four mitochondria. Are you saying that um Noah's wife uh, slept with Ham? Yes. Yes. So in a way, the Bible doesn't discreet. They kind of like. Keep it discreet, but 
because it was kind of like a shame thing so that they kind of like said it in a different wording yes gives a kind of a polite way but we know from other passages in the bible when god talks about what does it mean when you uncover someone's nakedness he gives it in like five different places including one of the minor prophet books he saw his he, he slept with his aunt and then it says in the very next, next verse, he saw his uncle's nakedness by doing that. Well, Jacob's son um, slept with uh, one of the maids, Jacob's maids. And it, it says that clearly in the Bible. So that's why I'm kind of, I was confused. Why was it here? In this case, it was discreet. While in Jacob's um, story, part of the section, his son, oldest son, he... Uh, it says that he went on to the, the, or the second wife or the wife that didn't. Yeah, no, I, I definitely get your point. Um, you know, that you could say the same thing about, you know, Lot and his daughters. Um, I mean, that was an immoral act also. But, right, but they thought that they didn't have any other chance. Yeah, but God, you know, the, you know, there's many examples I give where God says one thing. It's just like the Gospels, so they're different. Uh, but they say the same thing. There's no contradictions. But God explicitly says what that phrase means. Otherwise, you have to think that Ham simply seeing his dad naked is some kind of curse on his son. That, that, that makes absolutely no sense. Well, the Bible that never contradicts itself. In fact, yeah. the Bible builds on itself. So, And other places of the Bible kind of proves what this case was. Exactly. So yeah. the four mitochondrial is from the four women, the three daughter-in-laws and the wife herself. Yeah, so basically in, in a way from, you know, uh, Noah's wife twice. I mean, Noah's wife and then the three daughters-in-law because Noah's wife was involved. Thank you. Sure. We don't know exactly the exact circumstances. We don't know if wife's, Noah's wife, we know that Noah was drunk. The Bible says that. So his wife probably was too. And Ham took advantage of the situation. He might have been drunk too, you know? Who knows? But that's, it was a polite way for God to say what happened. And it makes perfect sense then as to why Noah said Canaan's now going to be cursed. And we know from the Bible that the son is not responsible for the sins of the father. So why would Canaan be cursed? He was cursed because of his, what his, he wasn't cursed like you, you put an X on him and, you know, this immoral act was going to make, it's just like I could say, Kids from a single family, from a divorced family, like, you know, um, a, a single mom, that kid is more cursed than one that has both parents. We know that from scientific evidence of, you know, more, you're more likely to, to go to prison. And I'm not taking a slam at single moms. Let's be more guys who leave their wives. But we know that statistically, it's the poor child has a harder means now to avoid prison because there's an enorm, enormous number of kids go to prison from a single parent household. It's not the parent, it's not the kid's fault that the dad left, but he's cursed in the sense that he has a more difficult uphill battle to make for not having a father in his life. Okay, I... <clears throat> I, I saw you mention the lion laying down with the lamb, and I don't know if I'll get this opportunity again, but I want to take a quick survey. How many people know or don't? Well, how many people have heard in the Bible that the lion lays down with the lamb? Just a show of hands. Okay, I, I would say it's a majority. And it, it is kind of funny because it just doesn't say that. It says the lion lays down with the wolf. But so I always thought it was lion, lion lays down with the lamb until a short time ago. And it was mentioned even by, um, I think it was G.K. Chesterton, C.J. The, the Chesterton gentleman with the two initials in the front. Yeah. G.K. Okay. And then uh, there was an atheist um, writer who was talking about the Bible and why it wasn't didn't make sense or whatever he was writing about. But he mentioned lion laying down with the lamb too. And this was way back, 
when those guys were in their prime. And uh, so I, I was just wondering why that was, because it caught me by surprise until I think earlier this year. Yeah, I, I raised my hand when he asked the question. Interesting. Huh. Yeah, and how far back do they go? Way, way back, I guess. Hmm. You have all these angels singing to the shepherds, but that's the point. They proclaimed. They didn't sing. So it doesn't say in the Bible that they sang. Well, like a lot of people show that in Hallmark or in other movies, they proclaimed the um, blessings and the and the beauty. And it says that in the Bible clearly. And Hallmark and many Hollywood uh, movies, they turn that around and like he said in a minute, everything turns secular. So that's the, that's what the devil's work. He wants a lot of people to be confused or turned away from what the Bible truly says. By pictures, it shows that Jesus was white. Well, that's the point. He's dark skinned and it said so in the Bible. I, I don't know exactly specifically what because it's brain fart. I forgot, but it says that he was dark skinned which a lot of people don't know. I mean, it doesn't mean that he's black or white, but many draw him as this purely white, beautiful, but he was probably beautiful. I don't know, but we don't know Jesus. And a lot of drawings and a lot of different secular ideas come into the, uh, the church and the devil does that on purpose just to confuse us. On the way over here, I was telling my wife that one of my new rules of exegesis is read what it says, not what we think it says. Sorry. But that what my real question is <laughs> back to the <clears throat> mitochondrial DNA. Yeah. Um, why do we think that we have major, major, um, I guess, threads in the mitochondrial DNA that haven't changed all that much? supposedly since the time of Noah's flood, um, why do we think that there has not been that much change since then, and yet there was enough change before then for those four women to have noticeably different threads, if you will? Um, okay, so your question is, we have a certain number of changes since the flood, and then how do we know how much we had before the flood? Um, I, well, I'm, I'm looking at before the flood, there would be fewer years than there have been since the flood. Mm -hmm. um, and yet you have enough diversity there that supposedly those four threads have been preserved pretty well over thousands of years yep. versus probably less than 2,000 years beforehand. So we, we, we're, we're, we're coming back to a, um, a lot of diversity over a shorter period of time. Okay. So why? So um, the, the work on mitochondrial DNA, so when they originally did their work, they had they only had so much samples. So they estimated the mutation rate based on what they're looking at. When they look at mitochondrial DNA through each generation, when they can, and they had very limited data. From that limited data, they said, oh, we found out that there was a common ancestor that all women are related to, and they called them mitochondrial ladies from Science Magazine. Um, and then when they dug up the Romanovs, you know, that Russian uh, royalty family, they got a lot more, they provided them a lot more mitochondrial DNA and they had to calibrate their clock. In fact, it's called, the article refers to calibrating the mitochondrial clock and they found out the mutation rate based on what they know from that generation to our current generation, that the mutation rate was faster. So when they then run that through their genetics, their genetic population models, they go back to a person 6,000 years ago, which fits that if you could take that back, you're gonna, you would go back to the first common ancestor of all the mitochondrial DNA, which would be E. Now you have the, the population, you have what's called a bottleneck that occurred at the flood. 
And so you at that bottleneck, everybody's wiped out except for the three, except for four women. No one's wife and the three daughters-in-law. So you think from the flood, since that's a since that's a, a bottleneck, those three daughters are then going to propagate their mitochondrial DNA. And you would think the mom, Noah's mom, Noah's wife, that mitochondrial DNA would be lost because Noah didn't have any daughters, or at least that we know of, right? So you have three sons of Noah, three daughters-in-law that aren't related to Noah. We only have three lines, but we actually ended up with a fourth because Noah's wife slept with Ham. So anyways, that's what they, they're using the mutation rate that they found out was much faster when they got that Romanov family dug up and they looked at their mitochondrial DNA and they compared the differences to them now, to us now, to them. And so they re did their mutation rate and then calculated how far back is this mitochondrial lead. They used to love their number because it was 100 to 200,000 years. They love that because it contradicts the Bible. We know this is a spiritual war. There's much more going on than just a secular scientist finding something. They're, you know, they're, they do not want this thing to, to match the Bible. They may not think that subconsciously or even consciously or subconsciously, but that's what they want. They don't, they do not want anything they find to match the Bible. And when it does, they use words like horrendous. <laughs> <laughs> or like Ann Gibbon said in that article, this can't be the case. Okay, deny the evidence. Just like they deny the evidence from soft tissue and dinosaur bones. Dinosaur DNA. They've even found dinosaur DNA now. The, birth, the general bone is reported on DNA and dinosaur, but they still, some will still deny it. Just as they would deny the prophets and if someone were to be rose from the dead. Um, we've got somebody looked up the scripture about the <clears throat> lion and the wolf. So here it is. Sure, it actually occurs in two places in Isaiah 11. Uh, verse 6, it says, the wolf also shall dwell with the lamb. And then in Isaiah uh, 53, 7, or rather 65, 25, the wolf and the lamb shall feed together. So to that extent, yes, you don't see the lion and the lamb. But if you keep reading in both of those, Isaiah 11, 6, the wolf shall also dwell with the lamb. The leopard, the lion, uh, shall lie down with the young goat, the calf, and the young lion, and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. In Isaiah 53, sorry, 65 again, the lion shall eat straw like the ox. So what you do have is there's no war between the animals. So it's perfectly logical that the lion could lay down with the lamb, just as the kid can lay down with the serpent. So I'll just extend that that is some eisegesis perhaps to it rather than straight exegesis, but I think it's consistent. And um, I'll just throw this in because, again, that's a very long and deep theological argument that many people have many different disagreements on. Are you pre-trib? Are you post-trib? That all plays into this very question. Because if you believe in a thousand-year Christ, Christ reign, those animals are on planet Earth with the kingdom Israel. If you believe in that viewpoint, and everybody but the nation of Israel is in heaven. And so um, it's a wide, huge fascinating topic that there's no way we could cover that in a question or even a even a night <laughs> of talking about it okay we probably ought to be wrapping up here it's a little after nine um does anybody have a prep oh yes i just so say that uh uh so if you look at, uh, this is about, uh, do dogs go to heaven? If you look at Psalm 68, uh, the first few verses are like, uh, let God arise, let his enemies be scattered. But if you go down to the 23rd verse, it says that your foot may crush them in blood uh, and the tongues of your dogs may have the portion from your enemies. Uh, <laughs> if the if the rapture happened, the dogs have to remain on earth to have the enemies. <laughs> so if they remain on earth and you believe in the rapture, then yeah, hopefully they'll be, you know, whoever's remaining on earth. So I think 
don't quote me, I think Doug mentioned that as a verse that was for dogs. But again, you can't really draw a conclusion definitively. And that's what I have said um, about my position is I can't draw conclusively. I can't, I'm not gonna die on that hill. It's not a hill I can die on because I wouldn't have enough. I'd be an idiot to try to say that this is true. I'm just telling you this is what I think is the case based on you know, the clues out of Job and a few other places. So. Okay. Um, I'd like to ask one more question, even though it's late. Sure. <laughs> but I'm going to throw this out as a maybe a research topic because I'm not sure that it's uh, going to be something that can be easily answered. It's another probably big discussion topic that involves astrophysicists. So the uh, Webb telescope. Uh, is reported to have recently observed uh, an elevated level of background light coming from deep space where there aren't any sources, apparently, uh, that they weren't expecting. And obviously, it's a brand new observation, so they haven't even generated any explanations for it yet. My question is, do you think that this could be... Um, have something to do with the zero point energy issue of deep space, since the zero point energy is associated with, with the vacuum of space rather than um, objects and matter that are in space. Well, let me quickly, Rob, I'm gonna teleport to some other time and get a degree in astrophysics physics and a PhD in engineering combined, and then I can ask your question. Yeah, so when you come back next time you talk, you'll <laughs> open it. <laughs> it's a great question. Uh, and that'll be interesting to see how they theorize what they're finding out there. But we do know that there's zero point energy. You can't get around it. Uh, and there's a quantum world that, you know, Bob Inyard had become super fascinated with before he passed. I think the last three years of the radio show, we had a show here and there on it. And I was totally, not interested, I'll be honest with you. I didn't, I don't, I'm not gonna say I didn't necessarily necessarily believe it, but it's like, oh, what is this goofy stuff? Let's get to something else. And now I'm like totally enthralled by it. I'm just, I can't watch enough of it. When I go to bed, I'm sorry, Jesus, sometimes I don't read the Bible. I'm watching YouTube videos on special relativity <laughs> and quantum entanglement and quantum tunneling, because it is so cool. And quantum entanglement, just like everything ruins the worldview for a materialist, quantum entanglement is unbelievable. It's not that hard to understand from a layman's point of view, from the, from the, you know, from the trees. You know, you got one particle on one side of the universe, knows the spin of the particle on the other side of the universe. How can that be? Because light can't travel that fast. So there's information. It has to be information. It's like God has, he has pointers in, his, in, in memory where he can flick a switch and change whatever he wants. Inf MIT, there's guys on, on board, MIT says everything's information. The universe is a simulation. You know, they, they don't want to admit it's God, so they call it a simulation because they can't get around the fact that quantum mechanics, the quantum world is just so fascinating. It shows that there's something beyond material and energy. There's information. Don't get me started because then we won't get out of here till whenever, you know. But yeah, so anyways, Bob was super enthralled with that topic and I, I can't wait to hear more about you know, this energy they're finding from the expanse of space and, how, you know, how it plays into all the stuff that they're discovering. You know, there's this whole new physics out there called quantum mechanics that, you know, we're, we're learning more and more about. So. All right. Well, with that, we can look forward to Fred teleporting back here again with uh, <laughs> renewed information. Who knows when that's going to happen, but... Uh, maybe it's a quantized sort of thing. Well, there's transposition in quantum mechanics. You can be in two places at the same time. Okay. That's a whole nother one I'm researching. There, there you have it. <laughs> there you have it. So um, anyway, we'll, we'll be working on that with Rocky Mountain Creation Fellowship. And, uh, and <laughs> we'll, we'll, some, we'll get some top go, men on it. Let's go get some refreshments. So uh, thank you again, Fred. Let's have another round of applause. <laughs>